Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started since we heard the, the sounds of CNI uh, welcoming us to start our session. Um, my name is Laurie Alexander. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Learning and Teaching at the University of Michigan. And this is my colleague, Justin Schell, who is a learning design specialist. Um, and we wanted to let you know that today's session is recording, is being recorded, which is why we're kind of bound to the capturing system. So, um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, this morning, Justin and I are going to really focus on our recent work with our design labs. Uh, the notion of a design lab is not particularly new to us. We've had one on our North Campus in our digital media commons for many years, um, which really focuses in on a certain set of disciplines. So the engineering uh, schools up there, art and architecture, music, and um, art and design. So many of the making communities, we've had this uh, design lab in our uh, digital media commons that has really worked to partner with those different disciplines. And we've learned a lot from that lab, and it's really served as an example for how we can take an active role in uh, extending learning experiences beyond the classroom, um, both in terms of online things that we can do, technology things we can do, but also real world types of um, activities. And that the design labs in particular have a real focus in on student learning. So we've seen um, a real increase in the need for students to have opportunities to be immersed in environments that build skills, that build specific knowledges, but also we have really um, gotten many more demands and requests to have different types of activities and support and engagement around how to help students function in society, to function in their careers, to function in things that require skills like teamwork, collaboration, innovative learning uh, leadership qualities, and to have environments that help them learn how to have those skill sets in fluid environments and to be very fluid. So about two years ago, we asked ourselves, um, how can we extend and apply this, mo this uh, model, this notion of a design lab, but apply it to different disciplines? So how might we uh, apply it to the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences? Did it make sense? Would it translate? What wouldn't translate? Uh, could we open further possibilities um, about how these disciplines, as they are looking at increasingly adding peer collaborative learning into their curriculum and into their work, how could we actually think about how the design lab might help support that transition? And is there a way that the library specifically can further meet um, both some of the unmet needs around expertise that's needed to help with this and also to leverage new approaches to um, scholarship as they're being created? So to that end, um, two years ago, we proposed to our provost to launch a design lab on our central campus in our Shapiro Library to explore these questions. So success with our design lab on our north campus around a set of disciplines, how might we translate that to our central campus around a new set of disciplines. So Justin and I today are going to talk about our journey that we've taken to date uh, to move the Shapiro Design Lab from a notion um, to a question to reality. Um, and we're going to dive into concepts like iterative learning, design, creativity, knowledge creation, interdisciplinarity, connected learning, and we'll share both our highs and lows as we kind of work through these different issues. And most importantly, we want to leave time at the end for conversation with all of you about what you're seeing, how this fits or doesn't fit with your campus, and, and kind of share some lessons learned. Oh, I should also mention, um, this is our, um, our mascot. Uh, that Justin designed our our design lab uh, so, uh, that we did on a 3D printer. So it's kind of a fun a, a fun approach to that. So before we um, get started, we wanted to take a few moments. Can you move forward yep. to the next slide? Um, to to look at a few images and ask ourselves the question: What kind of learning? takes place and we just ran we, we pick, went out and picked some pictures we want to spend some time thinking about what kind of learning does this space enable and we had an interactive session uh, prepared where you were going to be able to log in and add your thoughts to this but the Wi-Fi is not working so we're going to do we're going to go to plan B which is for people just to yell out their answers old-fashioned talking old-fashioned talking so what kinds of learning does this space enable thoughts Collaboration, brainstorming, brainstorming. Partner. partner, yep, okay, we'll go to the next, loud, loud. Mm -hmm. good, possibly sleeping with a in front of the chair, that's yep. true, that's true, 
What kind of space does this uh, enable for learn? What kind of learning happens here? Sandbox. Sandbox. Creation. Creation. Possibly teamwork. Teamwork. What's the role of technology in that space? Pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> flexible. Flexible. Great. Next one. How about this space? Individual learning. Presentation. Interactive, I heard. Are there people from Indiana here? Right or is anyone from Indiana here who recognizes what this space, space is? <laughs> <laughs> Cursor is being funky. What about this? Practical. Practical. Teamwork. Teamwork. Real world. Perhaps some sort of um, uh, mentoring might be going on in there. In our last space. Getting there. What might be happening here? Casual hangout. Transition. Transition. Mm -hmm. And yet the students are actually adapting it for other purposes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Some visibility. Visibility, yes. So it's transparent what people are doing in that space, right? And the students want to be seen. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time as we were thinking about uh, the Shapiro Design Lab around this question of what concepts should be at the forefront of our thinking when developing spaces that facilitate partnership models, that facilitate collaboration, that facilitate coming to peer learning, those types of things. Um, and we um, looked at different places, we talked with different people, we looked at our design lab on North Campus, um, had lots of discussions about that. And what we came to um, is in our first iteration, is um, the, the idea that we have an answer for the moment, right? And that we're actually okay that this space is gonna evolve and continue to grow and change. So at the moment, we think a lot about digital scholarship. And by that, we in many ways are asking the questions around what are the capabilities needed to support scholarship in a digital era? right so what are they some of them might be analog actually and some of them might actually be technical capabilities we talked a lot about the residential experience so what um, given all the affordances of online learning what is the unique role right now that the residential experience could serve as a differentiator to learning we talked a lot about collaboration. Um, it's showing up in lots of places in lots of different ways. So how are we gonna support it? A certain type of collaboration or collab you know, collaboration with a small C, a big C, a, a specific disciplines, how do they all look at that differently? Expertise, what expertise does the library currently have? How might we map that differently into the conversation? And what expertise do we not have that we need to go get? Um, this whole idea of iterative, um, how do we actually uh, set it up so that this service, this program, is by its very nature going to, going to have a mandate to grow and continue to a change and ad uh, adapt? How can it be a place of incubation? How can it really take advantage of the notion of peer-to-peer -peer learning? That's something we say a lot, but what does that actually mean? And finally, this notion of how can we um, provide uh, both the space, expertise, and partnership that really helps as our campus is trying to think about extending learning beyond the classroom. So before we kind of jump into what we've done with the Shapiro Design Lab, I thought I'd share three concepts from our North Campus Design Lab that have really informed our thinking as we've been thinking about um, our new design lab. So um, this, these are all from our digital media commons. Um, and I thought I'd take three concepts, the first one being around open pedagogy. So, and use real life examples to show what we mean by that. So the design lab is uniquely, um, it's not reservable for an exclusive use, right? And it's intentional in that. Um, it, it actually wants to have multiple activities happening at the same time. So even where there might be a lab going on, like you can see in the front 
of the picture on the right, um, there's also some activity and some other work going on simultaneously in a different part of the room. And um, the example I've used is Takumi Ogata, uh, who's the student there. He built this sound tunnel um, for a Performing Arts Technology 252 interaction design class. He was in the design lab working on it, and um, the whole point of that instrument that he was building was it's a way to use wind to control feedback um, and excite resonant frequencies through the pipes. While he was working on that, a different faculty member came in for a different purposes. Uh, so Professor David Chung, he's in art and design, and he saw him and said, wait a minute, there's a link to what he's doing to a course I'm teaching on in the Studio 4D class. And he invited that student to come in to actually set the stage for the next set of, of um, areas of study that they were gonna do around uh, a unit of basically around sound. And so that's a great example of how the expert in this case is a student from a different um, setting coming into another class to become the expert to launch a discussion about a new topic in a course. So that's what we mean by open pedagogy. It's, it's, there's a benefit to people seeing what they're doing and being able to translate that um, from one space to another. The next um, example is around student leadership. So Connor Berry um, was a student. Uh, his uh, thesis research explored the emotional potential of asynchronous audio uh, communication. Um, but while he was using the design lab for his coursework, um, he became really interested in the idea of community, right? And how you could actually bring together different communities together to work on particular topics. So he created a um, ad hoc academic group called the Electronic Lunch. And it meets uh, once a month in the design lab. It brings members from the university community as well as um, the Michigan community, uh, the, the local community, and even um, from as far as from Detroit that people come. And they, br they do different topics. They, they try different things. If we had the ability to, for you to actually hear the audio, I was gonna show you the clip of him talking about his work. But in that clip, he um, is talking about um, the use of LumenBots and how they attached that concept and hosted workshops for people to learn how to use that. And they applied it into a local uh, parade that happens in Ann Arbor once a year called the Fool's Day Parade. Um, and so it's a great example of student leadership of having an idea, bringing people together, having the space and the support in order to do that, and then making an impact back out into the, into the community. And then the third example is about student research itself. So this is Robert Alexander. He recently uh, received his PhD in design science, but he started as an undergraduate um, and has had many roles in the design lab. When he first started as an undergraduate, he was a student, then he was a collaborator, then he was a mentor, then he started to host workshops. He became a leader, a performer, a director, a researcher, and this was all through his undergraduate master's and PhD work. Um, he really found a home in the design lab of that being a place where he could do his um, different work. And uh, the, the clip that we would have shown here is him talking about um, the work that he did um, uh, with NASA around sound and how he was actually able to use the, the tools available in our digital media commons in the space of the design lab to make that come forward. So I think what we, what we realized is that we have found ourselves at this kind of crossroads between the notion of engaged learning and digital scholarship. Um, and we've really asked ourselves, how do libraries fit into this scenario, this trend of learning by doing? Um, how do we offer space expertise and innovation as a way to have connected experiences? Um, and most importantly, how are we helping students ask questions like, who am I? What am I passionate about? What's possible? And that this kind of space, this kind of service, this kind of program helps them do that. Um, and I think that it's really interesting if you step back and think about libraries as historically being the place where this iterative, you're, you need to find information, you're going to go find it, oh wait, you can't do it, you're going to have some stumbling blocks along the way, and you're going to keep iterating until you find the information, and this is a new expression of that. So we really, um, really have embraced this notion as we think about our design labs. And so, um, as I shared, we uh, went to our provost two years ago, and we made a funding request. We, may, we asked for money for a position for the design lab. 
which has manifested in Justin. Um, we asked for hourly funds, and actually a relatively significant portion of hourly funds for the library, uh, from a library's <laughs> perspective, because we knew peer learning was going to be really key to this, and we wanted to have the student budget to actually um, have students be intricately part of building the design lab and delivering the services of it. And we also asked for an operating budget. And luckily, she said yes. And so now, <laughs> Justin goes, yay! <laughs> um, so now Justin's going to talk about what we've done uh, with the Shapiro Design Lab itself. Cool. Thanks, Laurie. Oh, uh, yeah, so I started <clears throat> at Michigan about four and a half months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a four and a half month report uh, on, on the Design Lab. So this is what we started with. Uh, this is about a thousand or so square feet total. Um, this is in the, as in the Shapiro Undergrad Library, which is a high traffic 24 7 space. Um, there is a space called the Tech Deck, which was a closed off sort of tech support computer lab. It had a poster printer in there, over there, that was uh, very problematic in that it needed to always be supervised. And so if it wasn't supervised, the space was locked. And so this really lovely space that no one was using. And so we eventually tore down that wall and moved it over to the side and now we have this large open space to play with. Uh, you can see some of our early paint choices and things like that. Um, so, you know, building this space from the ground up essentially has offered us a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges. Um, one, of the, one of the great benefits um, was that, you know, we have the digital media commons on North Campus, which includes a 3D lab. Um, a media conversion center and so we don't need to do all the things in the design lab and we can be you know uh, not necessarily choosy but we can say okay well they do that up there let's talk about one aspect of the project and, and so we don't need to replicate uh, the different spaces but there's also sort of structural limitations space. we can't solder in there because there's not good enough ventilation or things like that so we've been working through uh, the challenges inherent in this kind of space uh, as well as the opportunities that it provides. So we've been working through uh, three themes that have guided what I've called designing the design lab. And the first one is, uh, is collaborative and community. And taking from uh, my friend Stuart Barner's idea of the community garden as this really wonderful notion of the space. Um, where, going back to our partnership model, this isn't a production house. Uh, this is a project design, project incubation space. So if someone is coming in, they're there to learn something and to participate in this community and not just say, hey, I've got this idea, go build this for me. Um, but also it's the idea that incorporating participatory design in the space itself. Uh, that could be with butcher paper on the walls, it could be you know online surveys. Um, one of the things about this space is that from where that, that first image was taken is usually filled with undergrads and how, how can we engage them with the design of that space? How can we have them teach workshops, uh, much like Takumi did in that earlier uh, example that Larry, Lori shared. It's also not just a space for people to use. Uh, there's got to be some level of partnership involved with it. Um, we, we have actually, I think, in about an hour there's an event going on in the lab and, and they just emailed me yesterday said, hey, what, there's going to be students studying there, what should we do? move around and engage the students perhaps uh, so it, you know you don't have the space just to yourself and so as Lori mentioned we did have funds for student workers so we've hired 12 student workers for uh, staffing the lab which and they have a range of, of backgrounds from architecture graphic design web design computer science and you know so they spent these last three months or so uh, working on internal library projects uh, to sort of demonstrate because this also is an internal library lab space and how can we encourage people within the library to think about different things. So we're working on a Twitter bot for special collections or we're working on an awesome box, uh, working on some visualization with publishing. Uh, but how can we encourage people and have people who have expertise in these different areas be guides for it. Um, so we were having lots of pop-up workshops in the space. I did two last week on uh, transcription and multimodal scholarship. Uh, we have one Thursday uh, with a letterpress, which I'll, I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, and we're, again, we're hoping to have some students teach these workshops as well from this space. Like, you know, what do you want to teach? What do you want to learn? Let's make that happen. You mentioned as well the iteration and experimentation. This is a, you know, I think a hallmark of, of anything worthy, call it, worthy of calling itself a design lab. Um, 
the emph for, for this space, the design is project design. And it's thinking through these different facets of a project, trying to get there very early in the process to think through uh, not just the technical aspects, but the methodological aspects, the ethical aspects. So we've had a lot of people come in and talk about social media collection and archiving and analysis. And so, you know, we can talk about the technical things. Yeah, here's, here's a Python script, here's Twark, et cetera. But let's talk about where the things are stored. Are you going to be using these? Can these things be traced back to individual people? And laying that out in conjunction with them. So they have a strong foundation to go on. Um, in this work, in the previous work as a Clear Fellow at Minnesota, the biggest thing that people um, people were presenting was that they didn't really know how to get started. They knew sort of what they wanted to do, but they didn't know sort of the paths they could take. And this this sort of developing these pathways, developing these workflows, has been um, you know I think successful in the projects we've worked on so far, and I think is going to be a key element uh, with the design lab. Um, we're also trying to think about how we do this in the space itself. How do we convey this in the space itself? And so we're looking at a design competition uh, where people can design their own furniture for the lab. So if you have a prototype, prototype for a chair, we'll give you a fabrication budget and materials budget to try it out in the space. Or a design gallery. We have these 16 windows that are part of those walls, which means we have 32 surfaces to play with. What can we put on there? Um, and also, you know, we mentioned the digital scholarship, and this isn't necessarily limited to the digital. Um, this goes, you know, throughout what it means to be scholar, what it means to be community engaged learning, um, in a lot of different ways. So we have <coughs> our partnerships uh, with the Detroit Center, um, with uh, different Ann Arbor uh, community folks, um, and so this is these are you know sort of laying the foundation now for this. One project in particular that I, that I think illustrates this really well is a project with Wolverine Press, which has graciously let us use the Challenger proof press on the left from the, somewhere in the 19th century from upstate New York. We, it still has the spider egg sacs to prove it. Um, and uh, and the, so we're working with Fritz Swanson, who runs that, and Rebecca Chung, who's a School of Information graduate student, on being able to 3D print illustration blocks and eventually type to be used on the letterpress. And we are, right now we're looking through, we figured out how to make the 3D file from uh, from a scan of, of a text, so the an association with uh, Shakespeare's first folio. And now we're looking at the different materials that can be used to print because we have we have this right now, you see up there, but that will get crushed by the uh, cast iron and steel rolling pin that's about 40 pounds. And so trying to figure out what level of really super expensive material that we can use to have it not get crushed, but still have the detail needed um, as compared to something like, you know, acid etched illustration blocks and things like that that they use. So we have our first workshop on, on this on Thursday. And finally, accessibility. And I'm using this term broadly and specifically. Um, for me, it's providing access in a sort of welcoming environment uh, for things that people want to try out, um, but don't know where to get started, and just people who are game to, to try and explore stuff. Um, you know, people have come in asking how to do the how to do something it's like, cool, let's figure it out. And I think that's that's the sort of environment that we want we want to, to connote. Um, we're still working on getting the folks who are right next door to us in the the open sort of study areas to come in and work on that. Um, so a lot of it has been the sort of parallel track of you know, we have people where we're connected with campus partners and we're working with researchers and graduate students and faculty and staff who are doing things and I welcome them into the design lab and then then also trying to figure out how we do this with the space itself. Um, so we're offering these away, but we're also incorporating accessibility into the very fabric of the lab. Um, I have a fair amount of background in doing this as a, as a filmmaker and media producer and the, the photo on the left is a very poor quality photo uh, because I almost forgot to take a picture of it. It's a GoPro attached to a wheelchair with various devices and we were, I was working at a movement rehabilitation center and doing video production with iPads and GoPros. And so thinking about how we can incorporate work like that into the lab, um, we're working with a number of accessibility specialists to, again, very early on in the project, talk about um, how you would make this successful, but less so, you know, as uh, requirement or compliance there has been a theme in a number of, of talks in this thing about not just making this about compliance 
Um, there was a there was a professor whose syllabus I read, and and the the accessibility statement read, as required by law, these things are available. And I was like, Ugh, we don't. Think. And so we talk about how, you know, say if you do this in an audio format instead of a paper, what creative opportunities does that enable, rather than you know, oh, you should make this an audio format so this person can could understand it. And so thinking, you know, combining this with, with things like multimodal or multimedia scholarship, um, and being able to um, to expand what's possible with this. So we're also working on things like tactile maps for the space, um, and topographical maps with a 3D printer. And so um, just thinking through a lot of the different possibilities that we can do um, with a space like this, with some of the technology, have, but, but also with um, you know a commitment to accessibility as part of this. But also another example of, of, of going back to the, the first definition of accessibility is a really an emphasis on citizen science in the lab. And this is a, a nice complement to what I see as the library's um, engagements with the, the scientific process. So whether it's collection development, research data management, teaching in classes. And so I've worked for the last couple of years with Zooniverse, the citizen science outfit um, based at the Adler Planetarium in Oxford and the Folger and a number of other places. And they do crowdsourced analysis of scientific data. You can count penguins and, and transcribe Shakespeare and things like that. But engaging people with the scientific process. And so being able to have you know, these projects up on, up on touch screens for people to engage with, but also work on data gathering and collection, air quality monitoring, water quality monitoring. We have a wonderful public library that has data, sens data uh, sensors that you can check out. And so being able to incorporate uh, this aspect of the scientific process into the lab and into these kinds of spaces and perhaps then move uh, into sort of the real world learning or a different path than they might have thought of um, earlier before they before engaging with this so we'd love to show you more pictures of what the lab looks like uh, but it's still a work in progress um, things like furniture delays and sign shops and things like that. So Furniture ordered in August, still not here yeah. yet. <laughs> um, so we, we have this really nice design on the wall and we chose some colors. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? It's, be it's gonna say Design Lab there uh, sometime soon. We are currently investing in a vinyl cutter so we can make our own signs. Um, and we, you know, we have whiteboards up, the, the tables there, uh, we were gonna put wheels on them and steel case took a month to say they don't make wheels for those tables. So we are figuring out what we're going to do with those. Um, but a lot of these, you know, these things are, as, as Lori said, constantly iterating. And I don't ever want to get to a space where I could say, like, here's the design lab, because it would be here's the design lab today. Um, we've, we've had conversations with people saying, hey, there's this table over here. Do you want that back? So, no, that's where it should be. So, uh, so I think as, you know, these are, these are the answers that we've come up with so far. And uh, so we're returning back to this question, um, what concepts should be at the forefront of our thinking when developing spaces that facilitate partnership models? And we'd love to hear what you think of our answer and what, uh, how you've answered that question and just generally engage you with, with some conversation. Well, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks.